questions, and we're going to wrap up the Civil War section of the program tonight with a good talk by my friend Thomas DeBlack. Uh, Dr. DeBlack earned the BA at Southern Methodist University and the PhD in History at the University of Arkansas. He is an Associate Professor of History at Arkansas Tech University and serves as Arkansas Tech's Program Director for Graduate Studies in History. Dr. DeBlack is author, co-author, or editor of three books, including Arkansas, A Narrative History, and With Fire and Sword, Arkansas, 1861 to 1874. And both of those are available outside, and I'm sure Dr. DeBlack will be glad to sign copies of those after the program is over tonight. He is active in a number of scholarly and professional organizations, including the Arkansas Historical Association, which he serves as president, and the Arkansas Association of College History Teachers, which he serves as vice president. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Thomas DeBlack. Thank you, Brooks, and uh, thanks to all of you for being here. I want to say, first of all, it's a pleasure for me to be asked to take part in this series. I know some of the participants personally and the others by having uh, read their work. So and I, and I think Brooks done a great job putting this together. Uh, in talking about the Civil War in the Ozarks, you had, you had Professor Piston talking about today about Wilson's Creek. What I'm going to try to say is going to have about three themes. And one is that I think Understanding the war in the Ozarks is central to understanding the Civil War in Arkansas. Secondly, it was, I think, the most devastating, the most destructive, the most bitter uh, theater of the Civil War, certainly in Arkansas, and one of the most destructive and bitter in the entire nation. And thirdly, I think that the Civil War in the Ozarks was, from the beginning, different from the war elsewhere in Arkansas. Now. <clears throat> Having said that, I think it's it's very fitting, and I think it's very correct that your your conference is treating this as a, as a civil war in the Ozarks. So when Professor Piston talked about Wilson's Creek, uh, that fits right in because it, it, there's a real sense in which state boundaries are artificial when it comes to talking about the war in the Ozarks. Uh, by that I mean that the war in the Missouri Ozarks has much more in common with the war in the Arkansas Ozarks than the war in the Arkansas Ozarks does with the war in the Arkansas Delta. But since what I know is, 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 is mainly south of that border between Arkansas and Missouri, that's the part I'm going to, to dwell on. Um, again, I think that from the beginning, this war in the Ozarks is a, is a different case. It's a, and, that, and that begins even before the war starts. If you go back to the election of 1860, the presidential election of 1860, when there were four candidates for president and the Democratic Party had split, nominating a northern Democratic candidate, Stephen Douglas of Illinois, and a southern Democratic candidate, John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky. Northwest Arkansas, the Ozarks of Arkansas, voted by and large for John C. Breckinridge. Breckinridge carried this part of, uh, of the state, uh, which is may seem at first, uh, first line a little unusual, since Breckenridge was generally considered the, the candidate most identified with Southern rights, protection of slavery, uh, and considering, as Stephen Douglas said, that while, it was, while, it was, while, while not every Breckenridge man was a disunionist, it was certainly true that every disunionist was a Breckenridge man. So it may seem unusual that people in this part of the state where slavery was no longer a major factor would vote for a candidate so aligned. But people, I think, would explain that by saying that Breckenridge was a Democratic candidate. And this was traditionally a Democratic region. And he was the candidate of the Democratic Party, so they voted for it. Uh, this also brings us to another point, and that is that what goes on in, in this region of the Ozarks is, in a very real sense, isolated from what's going on elsewhere in the nation. But it is also impacted by things that are going on elsewhere. So to put that in some context, what's going on? Well, Breckenridge, despite the strong support he got in Arkansas and in, and in 
this part of the state in particular, loses the election, of course, to Abraham Lincoln in November of 1860. The following month, the first state, South Carolina, announces that, announces that it is severing its bonds with the Union, it secedes. And in between January 9 and February 1st, 1861, six more deep south states had joined that group of seceding states, including our neighbor to the east, Mississippi, our neighbor to the south, Louisiana, and our neighbor to the southwest, Texas, although not significantly, not Missouri. Uh, <clears throat> Arkansas was greatly divided over the issue of secession. In mid-February of 1861, these seven states already out of the union. In mid-February, Arkansas voters went to the polls and voted, or they were asked to vote on whether or not they wanted to hold a convention to consider secession. And if the vote was yes, to elect delegates to that convention. Well, this put unionist sympathizers in a bad position. On the one hand, they had to go out and campaign against the convention. But then asked voters, well, if you're going to vote for the convention, we hope, hope you'll vote for me. Asking people to vote for them as delegates to a convention which they hope will never be held. The results of that election give a good clue as to the mixed nature of Arkansas society in 1860-61. Arkansas votes rather overwhelmingly to hold the convention. But the majority of delegates elected to that convention were unionists. And these unionists, whose strength was here in the Ozarks, succeeded in electing one of their own, David Walker of Fayetteville, to be president of the convention to consider secession. Now, throughout the course of the next two weeks, despite in intense pressure from almost all the state's elected officials, from the governor to our two, two senators, despite a personal appeal from Jefferson Davis, <coughs> despite personal appeals from delegates from the seceded states, this convention narrowly refused at every turn to take the state out of the Union. And so this secession convention ends by refusing to vote to take Arkansas out of the Union. The margin on most votes was just what it had been on the election of the convention's president, about 40 to 35 in favor of the Unionist uh, segment. The only thing secessionists could get out of the convention was a promise to hold an election in August of 1861 in which the Arkansas voters would be asked if they favored secession or favored cooperation with the Union. Well, of course, you know that that vote will never be held because in event, events are going to intervene. In April, the Confederate forces are going to attack Fort Sumter. Abraham Lincoln is going to call for 75,000 troops to suppress the rebellion, including about 780 from Arkansas. So now the state is forced to choose. And this had always been the, the, uh, the Achilles heel of the, those in Arkansas who favored the Union's position. There was sort of a general consensus that while Arkansas might not be ready to join the other Confederate states, any attempt by the federal government to coerce those states would change that balance. And that's exactly what happens. After Sumter, after Lincoln's call for troops, David Walker reluctantly calls the convention back into session on May 6th, and this time the outcome is, is a foregone conclusion. Uh, this time, of the 70 delegates, only five vote against secession, 65 to 5 in favor of secession. Interestingly enough, four of the five are from the Ozarks. Isaac Murphy and, and H. H. Bollinger of Madison County, John Campbell of Searcy County, Thomas Gunter of Washington County. And after that initial vote, the president, uh, the, the president of the convention asked that the vote be made unanimous. Four of the five consented to that, only Isaac Murphy. Uh, and this, in, in what was certainly one of the most courageous and principled stands, steadfastly refused to change his vote. So the final vote for six was 69 to 1 in favor of secession. Murphy said, I have made my decision after careful consideration and I cannot change it. Uh, it was one of the, again, one of the most principled and one of the bravest things, one of the bravest actions in the entire war, one for which Murphy will pay dearly or later. Even this vote, 
though, even though it seemed lopsided, is not indicative of the true state of opinion in Arkansas about secession, particularly in the Ozarks, in this region right here. There's a great deal of concern that this new Confederate government will be dominated by the planters of the Delta. And even after the vote, that sentiment makes itself felt. The, the Unionist editor of the Fayetteville Democrat wrote this, quote, the same mob that can make Cotton King and Jeff Davis president, this same mob can tell you that only he can be trusted at the, at the ballot box who is a slaveholder, that a Republican government based upon the universal suffrage of white men is a disgraceful failure. And a Benton County Unionist wrote, quote, do you know that, the Confederate, that in the Confederacy your rights will be respected, that you will be allowed a vote unless you are the owner of a Negro? These things you do not know. Well, again, interestingly, when it comes time to send delegates to the Confederate Congress, Arkansas will send five delegates to the Confederate Congress. Four of the five had been Unionist before Fort Sumter. So Arkansas is a divided state. Bill Shea, very good historian at the University of Arkansas, Monticello, has argued that Arkansas was really not even truly a Confederate state because there is so much division in Arkansas. Well, the war came, and many Arkansans rushed to enlist in the Confederate Army. James Willis has argued that no other state had a larger proportion of its men fight for the Confederacy than Arkansas. But Arkansas would also provide more troops to the Federal Army than any other Confederate state except Tennessee. And this despite the fact that it has the third smallest white population of any Confederate state. <clears throat> and before any fighting had begun, discontent was all, already making itself felt in the Ozarks. Uh, by late 1861, a group of Ozark residents had formed the Arkansas Peace Society, probably <clears throat> the first organized resistance to a Confederate government anywhere in the seceded states. It, it, prompt, it pops up first in, in Searcy and Izzard counties. Pro-Confederate citizens in those two counties quickly arrest about 50 men suspected of membership in the organization and through threats of violence or threats of leniency or promises of leniency, <coughs> exact the names of other associates. And what they found out stunned them. The number of alleged members and the extent of its activities was surprising. The society had a constitution, a series of secret signs and passwords <laughs> so that a yellow ribbon tied on a fence or a cabin door meant that a member of the peace society resided there. If one member howled like a wolf, a fellow member would co-sign by hooting like an owl. That must have been a little strange. I, I might have suspected something was up. Two grown men met each other, one howled like a wolf, and one hooted like an owl. But uh, nonetheless, uh, and, and there, were, there, was, there were greetings and cosigns. If uh, one person said to another, it's a dark night, a member would know the answer, not so dark as it will be before morning. That let each know that the other was a member of the Peace Society. Well, by early December, the Searcy County Militia had arrested dozens of these Peace Society members and acting under orders from Governor Henry Rector had sent them south to Little Rock, 78 of them, in chains. The basis of, of Jimmy Driftwood's song, they had a long chain on. Uh, they were soon joined by detainees from Carroll County, Van Buren County, Marion County, Fulton County. In Izzard County, authorities adopted a different approach. Rather than face prison or worse in Little Rock, the accused men were given the opportunity to enlist in the Confederate Army. All accepted. And it worked so well that the authorities in Little Rock soon adopted that same plan. Of the 117 alleged subversives who had been dispatched to the Capitol, all but 15 chose to join the Confederate Army. They formed in two companies and shipped east of the Mississippi where they saw action at Shiloh, but many deserted at the first opportunity, sometimes stopping back in this area to 
to uh, meet briefly with their families before making their way to Missouri where they enlisted in the Federal Army, becoming that group known as the Mountain Feds. Uh, ironically, the 15th who didn't agree to join the Federal Army, uh, a grand jury family that died when they were released. Uh, so the, while the exact size of the peace society remains a mystery, as do its goals. Uh, the extent of its membership was, was quite impressive. Uh, in a letter to Jefferson Davis, Governor Henry Rector wrote that there were 1,700 members of the organization, although we only know the names of about 240. And historian Ted Worley has demonstrated that in, in these six counties where the Arkansas Peace Society was strongest, the ratio of slaves to the white population and the per capita wealth were significantly lower than in the state as a whole. Again, that class conflict which is going to manifest itself increasingly as the war goes on. Worley also concluded that the society's principal aim may have been just what it claimed, namely the protection of its members against all outsiders robbers, runaway slaves, and Confederate authorities. And he says this, the society intended to protect itself at home, not by rushing off to the stars and stripes. Left to itself in peaceful dissent, the Brotherhood probably would have been merely a unionist, unionist island of passive resistance. Drastic suppression by neighbors <coughs> acting in the name of the Confederacy, and harsh treatment by the military gave the members a fighting cause. So northern and western Arkansas, would continue to be Unionist strongholds throughout the course of the war. Now, the first Arkansas troops to see any real action saw it at Wilson's Creek in, in, in Missouri, as you heard about this afternoon. Uh, the war actually comes to Arkansas when the Federal Army, after that setback at Wilson's Creek, gains the upper hand, begins to chase the Confederates southward through Missouri. On February 16, 1862, the fighting spilled over into Arkansas near Potts Hill, and the next day, the Federal Army moved into Arkansas in force. <coughs> Flags flying, banners in the breeze, bands playing. It had been not quite one year since the vote for secession, and already a large Federal Army is making its way into Arkansas. So in, in actuality, the, the war in Arkansas actually begins here in the Ozarks. Uh, the Confederates retreated through Fayetteville, burning part of the town. The Union Army took up a presence in northwest Arkansas, divided its forces so that to, so to facilitate uh, the grazing of its, uh, of its livestock. And there the situation stood until the arrival of a new Confederate commander named Earl Van Dorn. Uh, Van Dorn had been sent to Arkansas because the two other major Confederate commanders, uh, McCullough and Price, didn't get along. Neither could seem to work effectively under the other, and so Van Dorn, Earl Van Dorn was sent to, to Arkansas. <clears throat> Van Dorn had visions of seizing St. Louis. He wrote that in a letter to his wife. He planned to go seize St. Louis, but before he could move on to St. Louis, he gets word that the Federal Army is now invading northwest Arkansas. So he has to change tactics to go on the defensive. Van Dorn rushed to the uh, northwest, prepared his force, and prepared to take the war to the Yankees. He devised a plan that on paper, on paper, seemed to be a very good one. He would move quickly to the north while the Union forces were still dispersed, intervene between the dispersed units and destroy them piecemeal. But in point of fact, the plan didn't work that way. The Federal forces were informed of the, of the Confederates' movements to the north. They consolidated their forces. Van Dorn has to switch tactics. He comes up with another pretty good idea on paper. Since they are reunited in a strong defensive position, he'll move behind them and attack them from the rear. Again, if this were a video game, a computer game, it would have been a good plan. Carried out by actual human beings in bad conditions, it turned into a disaster. His line became strung out, uh, 
detached front from rear. Uh, he finally has to order. He finally has to order one wing to take a shortcut to link up with him near Elkhorn Tavern near Pea Ridge. And there, on March 7th and 8th, in a two-day battle, one of the most significant battles, Professor Fistborn here, I would say the most significant battle, <laughs> the Confederates are defeated. And this was a battle in which they did not have the general excuse that they had more men and, and guns than we did. This army, again, referring to Bill Shea. Bill Shea has called it the largest and best equipped Confederate military force ever assembled in the Trans-Mississippi. They outnumbered the Union troops three to two in men and four to three in cannon. So no excuses on that front. What they did not do very well was, was, was they lost the battle of leadership. While the battle was still going on on the second day, Van Dorn withdraws from the field, leaving many of his men still engaged. And the two-day battle at Pea Ridge is a disastrous defeat for the Confederacy. And I would argue one from which the Confederacy in Arkansas never fully recovers. Now, this is not good. If it's March of 1862, you've not been out of the Union yet a year, and you've already lost the biggest battle that's going to be fought, that's not a good thing. Uh, Missouri, seemed, Missouri remained securely in Union hands. And they now, the Federals have now gained a foothold in the Arkansas Ozarks. As bad as the battle was, what followed it was even worse for the Arkansas Confederacy because Van Dorn uh, quickly removed what was left of the Army, including animals, ammunition, equipment, east of the Mississippi River, leaving Arkansas virtually defenseless. defenseless. And the Federal commander, Samuel Curtis, attempting to resupply his army and to keep track of what Van Dorn was doing. He must have been puzzled by this. Here's, this, here's what remains of the Arkansas Army moving now east. Curtis is sort of paralleling that movement along the southern border of southern Missouri. He wants to make sure that the Confederates are not going to turn up and try to move into Missouri again. An interesting side note here is that Curtis gets in, in a real squabble with one of his quartermaster officers here because he needed more horses. He's always after his quartermaster officer to get him more horses. And finally, a frustrated quartermaster officer shot back a note that said, I am not going to steal or jayhawk horses. And Curtis was so infuriated that he wanted to court martial them and would have had not Henry Halleck, his commander, taken a liking to the young man and removed him from the scene by sending him to the east. The young man's name was Phil Sheridan. Hmm. And within two years, he'd be commanded command with all the uh, cavalry behind the baton. Uh, his career might have ended right here in, in, in the Ozarks in this part of the war. Uh, so Curtis wants to make sure the Confederates are actually leaving the state. When he's sure that's going to happen, he re-enters Arkansas with the Federal Army on April 29th near Salem. He reaches right here, baseball, on May the 2nd. Two days later, another federal army occupies Jackson Fort. Their goal is Little Rock, 100 miles to the south. Now, uh, Freeman Mobley's already talked about the campaign in around baseball in Jackson Fort, so I won't dwell on that. Uh, except to say that this, these, this federal army gets about as far as Searcy, about 50 miles from the capital, when it begins to run out of steam. As Freeman Mobley, I'm sure, told you, uh, local militia, with the help of some Texans, one of the few times Texans have ever done much to help Arkansas. <laughs> the intervention of these Texans here does help stall the Federal Army, which had already was running out of gas. A long way from its supply lines, isolated in, in a hostile country, uh, Curtis realized he could not make it to Little Rock. Although, interestingly enough, the, the fall of the capital seemed so imminent that on June the 2nd, the New York Herald announced that it had already happened, uh, announcing Little Rock's capital had fallen. Also, the governor of Arkansas, Henry Rector, had decided that the capital's fall was so imminent, he had packed up the archives and left for Hot Springs, uh, a fact that gave his political enemies, of which there were many, uh, great political fodder. Uh, so we don't know where the governor was. There's no federal army here. Where's the governor? Well, the federals can't make it to Little Rock. They turn east and head toward Helena, arriving there on July 12th and capturing Helena, liberating slaves, 
as they go. This is six or seven months before the Emancipation Proclamation. Destroying whatever's in their path that they can't use, living off the land, bringing what would be later called in the Civil War, total war, to Arkansas long before William Tecumseh Sherman brings it to Georgia. Uh, to salvage the situation, Richmond sent the fiery Thomas Hyman, Arkansas congressman before the war, fire eater, to Arkansas to, to change the situation. And Hyman does one of the most remarkable jobs, I think, in the entire Civil War, of scraping together by any means necessary, a viable fighting force and equipping it in a state that had been left almost totally stripped of everything by Earl Van Dorn. Uh, by September, Hyman was ready and launched a cavalry raid into southwest Missouri. The Federals sent three divisions to meet them, and they're driven out. And by late October, the, the rebels had fallen back across the Boston Mountains to Fort Smith. Federals occupy Fayetteville. In early November 1862, two of those three federal divisions go back to Missouri to their camps near Springfield, leaving only one division in Arkansas. And by December, this division, commanded by a man named James Blunt, was near Cane Hill in Northwest Arkansas, about 100 miles from Springfield and only about 30 miles from Hindman's Confederates at Fort Smith. Uh, Blunt was isolated. He's farther from reinforcements than he is from the enemy. Uh, and he knew that, but he was, uh, one, he is the kind of man, one of his soldiers said, Blunt seemed to think that the height of military astuteness was to get yourself surrounded and fight your way out. Uh, and that's essentially what he's inviting here at Cane Hill. Heinemann, always aggressive, found this just too tempting. He believed that he, he could distract Blunt and move toward Fayetteville. He could interpose himself between Blunt's army and any reinforcements that might come and defeat them in turn, and that would open the way back to Missouri. It's always about Missouri. Partly in fact, partly due to the fact that several of the major figures in the Arkansas Confederacy are Missourians. Sterling Price, former governor, James Sappington Marmaduke, Joe Shelby. It's always about bringing Missouri into the Confederacy, their home state. Their, their concern is not defending Arkansas, it's bringing Missouri to the Union from the beginning to the end. Arkansas suffers from that. Heinemann's caught up in the Missouri fever, too. If he can just defeat Blunt, the road will be open to Missouri again. And you probably know this story. He moves a remarkably revised and potent force north. Blunt, realizing his danger last, sends for reinforcements from Springfield. Heinemann's army reaches the vicinity of Fayetteville, and he is now trapped, not trapped, but he's caught between the Federals at Cane Hill and the Federal reinforcements coming down out of Missouri. And not knowing what to do, he takes position on the high ground at Prairie Grove and awaits developments. And there, uh, on December 7th, 1862, one of the most fierce battles of the Civil War in the Trans-Mississippi will take place at Prairie Grove. Prairie Grove is, is in many ways, the Civil War in Arkansas in microcosm. At one time in this battle, you have the 1st Arkansas Cavalry Union fighting against the 1st Arkansas Cavalry Confederate. That says a lot about the whole nature of the war in the Arkansas Ozarks. Well, in this slugging match at Prairie Grove on December 7th, neither a series of charges and counter charges and horrific casualties Neither side was able to dislodge the other, but the Confederates, their ammunition depleted with the food during the night, leaving the Federals in control of the field. One Union soldier wrote, quote, for the forces engaged, there was no more stubborn fight and no greater casualties in any battle of the war than at Prairie Grove, Arkansas. Well, the Battle of Prairie Grove, December 1862, really brings an end to major military operations in the Arkansas Ozarks. Now think about that. It's 1862. The war's going to last till the middle of 1865. And yet, with the possible exception of a 900-man cavalry attack on Fayetteville in August of, in April of 1863, major military operations are over. A couple of more cavalry raids into Missouri, 
move into Missouri, stir up a little trouble, get a bunch of people chasing you, retreat back to Arkansas without ever changing significantly the equation of the war. Uh, so less than two years into the war, and almost two and a half years of war, Area residents, residents of both political persuasions were already paying a heavy price. Now, one of the major hardships for both combatants and non-combatants in the immediate aftermath of Prairie Grove was the care of the wounded. Many of the wounded from both sides were taken to nearby Fayetteville for treatment. And there's a prominent <coughs> local citizen there named William Baxter who records his record of what happened during the war. Very good source. And Baxter writes this about one large building where he goes to visit some of the wounded. This is what he said. The entire floor was so thickly covered with mangled and bleeding men that it was difficult to thread my way among them. Some were mortally wounded, the life fast escaping through a ghastly hole in the breast. The limbs of others were shattered and useless, the faces of others so disfigured as to seem scarcely human. The bloody bandages, hair clotted, and garments stained with blood, and all these with but little covering, and no other couch than the straw with which the floor was strewn, made up a scene more pitiable and horrible than I had ever conceived possible before. And Baxter, noted, Baxter noted that 20, 20 other buildings offered similar 
national scenes. Uh, so any notion of this as a romantic adventure was long gone by this time. The battles and raids of 1862 and 1863 had dramatically impacted the Ozarks, and this was nowhere more true than in Fayetteville. Fayetteville changed hands several times during the course of the conflict. As I said, in April of 63, there's a, a cavalry force of 900 Confederates attacked the town. It's a fierce battle. Union forces repel the invasion, and within a week, they voluntarily, voluntarily evacuate Fayetteville, and the Confederates come back and take it without firing a shot. Uh, no community in the state, perhaps, suffered more than Fayetteville. And, and counting again on William Baxter. Baxter was a Union sympathizer. This is what he wrote about the conditions. Schools and institutions of learning all broken up, <coughs> churches abandoned, the Sabbath unnoted, everything around indeed denoting a rapid lapse into barbarism. All trade at an end, nearly all travel suspended, the comforts of life nearly all gone, the absolute necessities difficult to be obtained. Everywhere were constant reminders of the presence of the recent departure of the opposing armies. Baxter again. The fences had nearly all disappeared. Shrubbery and fruit trees were ruined. Houses were deserted. Nearly all of the domestic animals killed. Dead cavalry horses lay here and there. The farms for miles around were laid waste, the fences having been used to keep up the hundreds of campfires, which were seldom permitted to go out by day or night. Stables pulled down, outbuildings burnt, and the very spirit of destruction seemed to rule the hour. Well, the situation in Northwest Arkansas, after the departure of the armies, deteriorated throughout the war into that rapid lapse into barbarism that Baxter described. And in late November, Robert Mecklin, a fable a Confederate sympathizer, wrote this, quote, no guerrilla warfare ever carried on in Mexico or any of the South American republics has been fraught with more evils than that now waged upon us in Northwest Arkansas. Theft, plunder, arson, murder, and every other crime of the black catalog have lost their former startling significance of horror by their daily occurrence amongst us. If we hear that one of our neighbors has been murdered, his house burned, his family left to freeze to death for the want of clothes and, and food, it is soon forgotten by us. Like many citizens of the state, Mecklen was unable to get any reliable information. We, 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 we tend to forget how isolated people were from the news of what's going on elsewhere. Mecklen wrote, quote, uh, we can never see a paper, either rebel or federal, and are in darkness as to what is going on except immediately around us. Well, the point that he was making that both Baxter and, and Mechlin are referring to is that they, they, in the place of organized military operations, a fierce guerrilla war now starts in Northwest Arkansas. And this war unleashed, as all wars do, the very worst elements of human society. In the Ozarks, bands of robbers and cutthroats preyed on the helpless and defenseless civilian population. It is, after all, the Ozarks of Arkansas and Missouri that give us Quantrell and Bloody Bill Anderson and Jesse James <coughs> and Cole Younger. Sociopaths at best, psychopathic killers at worst, and that was just the name of a few. On the western edge of the Prairie Grove battlefield, a group of men professing to be Confederate partisans visited the home of William Morton. If you go to Prairie Grove, the Morton House, one of the houses right there on the battlefield. Now that the battle's over, a group of men professing to be Confederate partisans show up at the house. And after gaining the family's confidence, they seized Morton, the, man, the, the husband and father, tied him up. Old man, one threatened, it's not your politics I care for, it's your money, and we're going to have it. When Morton refused to reveal the location of the money, the men heated two shovels in the family fireplace and began burning the bottoms of his feet. His daughter, Nancy, threw water on the shovel and on the fire, and another member of the gang beat her up with a pistol on the back and arms. When Morton still refused to give up his money, the gang took him outside and threatened to hang him. And finally, Morton gave in. The gang took all the money, ransacked the house, and departed. We all then went to bed shivering with cold, Nancy Morton remembered, afraid 
to make a fire. Throughout the state, but particularly in the Ozarks where the significant fighting had taken place, uh, the situation in civil society has deteriorated. County and local governments ceased to function. Sheriffs, clerks, judges, other office holders fled or, or failed to carry out their duties. Bill Shea has noted, quote, taxes went uncollected, lawsuits unheard, complaints unanswered, with courts closed and jails open, the thin veneer of civilization quickly eroded. I like that. The thin veneer of civilization quickly eroded. Incidents of murder, torture, rape, theft, and wanton destruction increase dramatically. Uh, by September 63, Joe Shelby, the famous cavalry commander, was leading his Confederate cavalry north into Missouri. A great raid that would cover 1,500 miles in 41 days. But uh, Shelby noted, as he begins to move north with 800 men through, through Huntsville and the ruins of Bentonville, which had been burned by federal troops into southwest Missouri, even a battle-hardened person like Shelby was alarmed. He said this, in many places for 40 miles, for 40 miles, not a single habitation is to be found. For on the road we met delicate females fleeing southward, driving ox teams, barefooted, ragged, suffering even for bread. In remote Searcy County, a band of Confederate guerrillas led by Captain Harry Love harassed Union forces. In March, Eight members of Love's band who were running to their, who were returning to their company stopped to rest and water their horses near a place called Richland Creek, near the community of Woolham. They were ambushed by Union soldiers firing from the nearby bluffs, and six of the eight were killed. Uh, five of the victims, James Angel, Temple Garrett, Garrett's son John Wesley Garrett, John Riggins, and Leif Rice, were all from the community of Rolling Prairie near present-day Eros in Marion County. Two survivors, sons of victims James Angel, fled to their home with reports of the deaths. On hearing of the news, two of Temple Garrett's daughters, 19-year-old girl Clementine, who was the fiance of one of the murdered men, <coughs> and 20-year-old Elizabeth, determined to retrieve the bodies and return them to Rolling Prairie for burial. These two women start south for Searcy County in a wagon pulled by a team of oxen. When they reach the site of the ambush, they exhumed the bodies of the five men from a hastily dug grave, loaded them onto the wagon, and started toward their home over 30 miles away. They had traveled over 20 miles, and the stench of decomposing flesh became too great to bear. Stopping in a small cemetery near the community of Rally Hill, they reburied the men in a mass grave. Temple Garrett's wife, Henrietta Henson Garrett, was convinced some of the family's neighbors had revealed the whereabouts of the guerrillas to the Union soldiers. And she later composed a ballad that told the story. I'm indebted to James Johnson for this, this whole story, in particular this ballad. This is the wife of one of the killed men. In 1864, when the Federals came at my door, they kicked, they raved, my things they claimed. They left my house all in a flame. But, oh, good Lord, that was not all. Soon after this, my friends did call. It was in March on the last day some person did my friends betray. This incident in a remote part of the Arkansas Ozarks demonstrates what was characteristic of much of the fighting in the Ozarks, the settling of personal grudges, masquerading as, as, uh, as fighting in, in, in the cause of the Civil War. The same was true in Conway County. Conway County is one of those counties which is in many ways a microcosm of the state. You know Conway County where Morgan is. Uh, Conway County has uplands in the northern part of the county, but the lower part of the county, the southern part, is along the river valley. And so you have a microcosm of this division state. Highlands, where there were a lot of Unionists, lowlands, there were birthed a lot of cotton, a lot of slaves, and simply the Confederacy. In the mountainous regions of the north part of the county, Thomas Jefferson Jeff Williams was a patriarch of a large extended family of farmers and staunch Unionists. In June of 1862, Williams led his four sons three sons-in-law, two brothers, four nephews, a brother-in-law, and several neighbors north to baseball to prevent them from being, from being conscripted into Confederate service. 
after a stint in the Federal Army in which Williams lost two brothers, a nephew, and a brother-in-law to disease, the family spent several months in Missouri. When Federal forces captured Little Rock in the fall of 1863, the Williamses and many of their Unionist neighbors returned to Conway County and formed an independent company to provide information to Union forces about Confederate sympathizers in the county. They got their own little civil war. Some evidence indicates that they also took revenge against some of the pro-Confederates who had harassed them earlier in the war. Uh, these activities made Jeff Williams a marked man. And on the night of February 12, 1865, a force of Confederate guerrillas numbering between 60 and 100 surrounded Williams' house near Center Ridge and called for him to come out. He turned to his wife and told her, my time has come. And as he opened the door, gun in hand, he was struck and killed by a volley of buckshot fired from 25 yards away. In the days and weeks that followed, Jeff Williams' son, Leroy Williams, assumed command of his father's company and began a personal crusade to avenge his father's death. In a series of separate incidents, Leroy gunned down as many as 16 members of the band that had murdered his father. And, he, and the records indicate that he sometimes would charge into the group of his enemies on his horse, the reins between his teeth, a six gun in each hand blazing away, a la John Wayne, true grip. Uh, his exploits earned him the nickname Wild Dick. And when the war ended, many former Confederates refused to surrender until Williams' independent company was disarmed. Now, Leroy Williams lives a long and fruitful life, and he lives a, a, into the 1920s. When asked shortly before his death in 1924 how many men he had killed, Leroy responded, too many. But I lack three more. 1924. He lacks three more. Like many residents of Conway County and the Ozarks, Williams was slow to forgive and forget. And the bitterness engendered by this war would far outlive the end of the conflict. So these instances of wanted brutality, mindless violence, outright barbarism, too numerous to mention. But suffice it to say that the Civil War in the Arkansas Ozarks bore no relation to the romanticized accounts that emerged after the war. It's much more cold mountain than it is gods and generals. Uh, to use a, a movie uh, analogy. It wasn't romantic, it wasn't glorious, it wasn't chivalric, it was none of that. While this guerrilla conflict raged, the, the regular military operations are coming to a close, and it's perhaps fitting that they would end where they began, in the Ozarks. Although it didn't start out that way. In the spring of 1864, the federal forces commanded a large-scale operation to seize uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, an army moving up from Louisiana, one moving south from Little Rock. This disastrous, ex disastrous expedition, called the Red River Expedition, or in Arkansas, the Camden Expedition, was a disastrous setback for federal forces. Ironically, 1864 was the worst year for federal forces in the entire Civil War in Arkansas. The failure of this expedition, in which both wings of the federal advance are defeated and sent back, the federal army barely making it back to Little Rock, breathes new life into what had been the moribund Confederacy in Arkansas. Everywhere in Arkansas, the Confederates were on the offensive, the Federals were on the defensive. How best to exploit this new momentum? Well, if you're Sterling Price, John Marmaduke, Joe Shelby, there's only one answer. You raid Missouri, of course. We're going to take Missouri into the Confederacy here in the middle of 1864. You raid Missouri. They're all Missourians. Uh, they even style their army, which was composed of a lot of Arkansans and has taken refuge in Arkansas, fought in Arkansas, the Army of Missouri. On August 28th, the, the Army of Missouri left Camden and headed north across the Arkansas River on September 2nd at Dardanelle with 12,000 men and 14 cannons. Sounds impressive, except 4,000 of those men had no weapons. 1,000 of them had no horses. 
And I would argue, ladies and gentlemen, that whoever recruited those guys was a pretty persuasive guy. You recruit somebody for a cavalry raid, you don't have a horse or a weapon. That's real commitment to the cause. Price himself was no longer the dashing figure who had sat his horse so gracefully, according to some accounts, in Wilson's Creek. 55 years old, that used to sound real old to me, it doesn't anymore. But Price had swelled somewhat in girth. Price was not one of those who had suffered uh, from starvation during the war. As a matter of fact, he is so fat he can't ride his horse. Uh, and this was something of a concern to, to Shell, to the dashing types like Shelby and Marmaduke, that the, this cavalry commander had to ride in the ambulance wagon because he was too fat for his horse, although the horse was undoubtedly relieved. Uh, on September 7th, the Army crossed the Missouri line headed for St. Louis. He's going to accomplish what Van Dorn was going to accomplish in 1862, seize St. Louis. He gets within 30 miles of St. Louis only to find out that it's been heavily reinforced. Can't take it. Bypasses it, turns west, heads for the capital of Jefferson City. Finds out that not only has Jefferson City been reinforced, but now the Federal Army from St. Louis is on his trail. Bypasses Jefferson City, two of his main goals. Turns northwest. By October 10th, he's at Boonville, Missouri. The Federal Army in front, again in the rear, another Federal Army forming along the Kansas border. By October 23rd, he reached Westport in the largest battle in the Trans-Mississippi in terms of number of soldiers engaged, about 40,000, near Kansas City. A decisive battle which sends the Confederates reeling south and retreat along the Missouri-Kansas line. Now this starts in Canada. It's going for St. Louis. Now they're Kansas City. He's crisscrossed the whole state. Two federal armies are pursuing him. Uh, October 24th, he crossed into Kansas. He's going now for Fort Scott. Like St. Louis and like Jefferson City, it proved too stout to attack, and he bypasses that. Camps his army for the night uh, on the 24th of October, 1864, near a river called the Marais de Seine in Kansas, ironically close to a spot where six years earlier, 11 free state Kansas settlers had been murdered by pro-slavery Missourians, where a soon-to-be-famous or infamous uh, Free stater named John Brown and later built a small fort. On the 25th, he moved toward Fort Scott in a trenching rain and reaching Mine Creek. 20 miles north of Fort Scott, he began to cross his army. But the, the creek was swollen, the crossing took much longer than expected, and here the Federals caught up with him. And the Federals attacked the Confederates as they attempted to cross the creek. One of those leading the charge was a young Lieutenant Colonel named Frederick Benteen. That name may sound familiar to you. Benteen. Frederick Benteen is going to perform admirably today at Mine Creek. Uh, Twelve years later, at the Little Bighorn, with George Custer, he won't perform quite as well. Uh, but at Mine Creek, the Federals destroyed much of the remainder of Price's army, and the retreat becomes a rout. Wagons litter the side of the road, equipment thrown away, Marmaduke captured, William Cavill, another Confederate commander, captured. October the 30th, the Army crosses back into Arkansas. And by November 1st, they're at Kent, and they're near Cane Hill, and near the Cane Hill battlefield once again. Ironically, they were not very far. This pitiful remnant of the Confederate Army was now not very far where, from where two years before, Van Dorn's magnificent force had marched north. Now they're marching south. The historian, Albert Castle describes it this way. Entire regiments, even brigades, of the Arkansas conscripts disbanded, riding in small parties, they headed for their homes and families. Faced with a situation he was powerless to remedy, Price instructed his commanders to return such of their men as still remained with their colors to the places where they had been. These guys are deserting and going home. And Price gives the order, let your men go home for a while. Tell them to rejoin us. Most would leave, few would rejoin. And Shelby's adjutant, John Edwards, who wrote most of his reports, said this, after crossing the Arkansas River, the worst stage of misery came upon the army, and their sufferings were intense. Horses died by the thousands. The few wagons were abandoned without exception. 
The sick had no medicine, the healthy had no food, the army had no organization, and the subordinate officers no hope. Bitter, freezing weather added terrors to the route and weakness to the emaciated, staggering column. Smallpox came at last as a natural consequence, and hundreds fell out by the wayside to perish without help and to be devoured by coyotes without burial. By the time the army, the army finally reaches Lane Ford in southwest Arkansas on December 2nd, only about 3,500 remained. So in a very real sense, the war in Arkansas ends along the banks of Little Creek in Kansas. It ends in effect in the area where it began, the Ozarks. The legacy of the Civil War in the Ozarks was a legacy of bitterness and hatred. William Baxter had been right. The very spirit of destruction had ruled the hour. And the impact of that destruction would continue to affect the Ozarks for many years.